as we all know, uh, Europe has launched the Green Deal and wants to accelerate in decarbonizing society. And the mobility sector is an important contributor to the CO2 emissions. And so if we can electrify mobility, that would be an important contribution to the decarbonization of the European society. And in achieving this electrification, fleet can play an important role, as fleet could create the start of an S-curve. Switching between two technologies like internal combustion engine and electrified uh, mobility typically goes into S-curves. That means that you have early adopters, but you have to create a momentum and that momentum can be created by fleet because fleet can also have a kickstart of the infrastructure rollout and therefore uh, can contribute that we have the S-curve coming in sooner uh, compared to if you would do nothing at the side of fleet. On top of achieving the Green Deal, also this is an important relaunch measure because electrical mobility today starts to be more and more in the money, meaning that company cars have a comparable uh, electrical car in the same range, so meaning that without additional cost we can actually have a stimulus to economy, including then as well the rollout of the infrastructure for charging those electrical cars. Well, Ilia issued last year in November a study about electrical mobility and the impact on the grid. And what we uh, did was we simulated 2030 with 1.5 million electrical vehicles in Belgium and 10 million electrical vehicles in Germany. And what we saw is by normal charging behavior of people, you would increase the peak load with 10%. 10% of peak load increase would mean actually that a lot of people would charge at the moment that prices are high, but even worse, that they would uh, need for the 10% additional peak load, that we would have to have plants that support the system at that moment of time that typically are more CO2 emitting and therefore the carbon footprint would become more negative. We also looked at smart charging and if we look at smart charging we saw that actually we got the opposite effect. There would be benefits for the consumer and there would also be benefits for society and therefore it's very important that we focus on getting smart charging adopted at a wide scale. As a consumer typically 90% of the time your car is parked and you only need two hours to charge your car for your average daily consumption. That means that it gives an important window of opportunity to shift charging at better moments of the day. So at the moment that there are a lot of renewables on the system and the prices are low. So for an average car driver that would reduce his cost of charging by 15 to 30% and in addition it would reduce its CO2 footprint, yeah, CO2 footprint that went already down with 70% by moving from internal combustion engine towards electrified uh, mobility with 5 to 10% on top of that. In the same simulation, we looked also what would be the impact for the system. So if everybody would smart charge, they would charge more at the moment that we have excess renewables. That would then also mean for the same reference year 2013 that we would have much less curtailment. And the uh, voided curtailment would be the equivalent of 300,000 vehicles they're charged for a whole year. So that's quite important uh, reduction that we would have in lost renewable integration into the grid. If we translate that then to CO2 emissions, this is an equivalent of 600,000 tons of CO2. So also a very important amount. And if we then look at the overall system cost, it would create an additional welfare of half a billion for the two markets, Belgium and Germany together. And that's because of course we would need less peaking plants to support the charging at the peak moments. Well, today we see already that quite some governments are taking measures to increase the attractiveness of electrical mobility. But what we see as well is that there are still important barriers. The most important barriers for a driver of an electrical car is the fact that there's still an important lack of infrastructure to charge his car. Second thing, there is a complexity in the data exchange that needs to happen with those cars that often charge uh, behind a meter. And then the last point is there need to be clear market rules uh, on how the charging will be then uh, invoiced to the right party. 
Ilya launched already two years ago an ecosystem which is called uh, Internet of Energy, where we had use cases around digitalization. And we used that ecosystem over the last year to have already specific use cases around e-mobility. One was around uh, how to have an all integrated leasing contract where somebody can charge wherever they want on one single invoice. Another was around blockchain. So how do we identify a vehicle that is mobile uh, connecting across a network? We still have a number of new use cases in the pipeline for the coming year within the same ecosystem, but we still need a lot more to make it happen that e-mobility is picking up fast. And therefore, this is a call to action to everybody that is willing to contribute to this so that they join us into that ecosystem and that we experiment so that we can deliver the best service to our clients. I am delighted to introduce Jamie Haywood, Regional General Manager of Uber. He has sent us a short message on the perspective of one of Europe's largest fleet operators. Over to you, Jamie. My name is Jamie Haywood and I run Uber's Northern and Eastern European rides business. At Uber, we're absolutely committed to electrifying our fleet. Uber drivers, like other professional drivers, drive significantly more than the average driver. Um, on average across Europe, it's about four times more. And what that means is that presents uh, an opportunity. The opportunity is, firstly, that obviously if we can move our drivers uh, into battery electric vehicles, uh, it matters more in terms of the, the quality of the air because they drive more. Uh, but secondly, it's an opportunity because actually we think uh, professional drivers will be the early mass adopters of electric vehicles because it's for professional drivers that the total cost of ownership, the break even point where paying slightly higher upfront uh, is compensated for lower four by lower running costs uh, makes sense. When you drive more, the value of the lower running costs uh, is obviously more. Uh, so that's why we've made a, a number of commitments to electrify our fleet. In London, we've made a commitment to be 100% electric by 2025, and I'll, I'll talk later about some of the reasons why uh, London is leading the way. But across seven cities in Europe, we've committed by 2025 to be 50% electric. That means 50% of all kilometers driven will be in battery electric vehicles in those cities. And we've also committed to be 100% uh, of kilometers driven in battery electric vehicles in any cities where the policy frameworks are in place to encourage a just transition uh, to electric vehicles for drivers. Lastly, we've committed to be fully transparent with respect to our CO2 footprint. So we'll be publishing data that uh, makes clear the CO2 per kilometer driven uh, for uh, rides on the platform in Europe. Now, when I look at the, these commitments, these are bold and aggressive commitments. And, and whilst I feel optimistic that we can get there, the area that currently causes me the greatest concern and causes our drivers the greatest concern is EV charging infrastructure um, and the lack of it. And it matters particularly to professional drivers um, like those on Uber, because many of them don't have off street parking. So they can't solve the problem of uh, charging their vehicle uh, by installing a home charger. In, in the UK, in London, 85% of drivers don't have access to off street parking. And that means that they're extremely dependent on public charging to be able to, to make the transition. And for our drivers, it's doubly critical because any time spent looking for a charger during the day um, is time that they could have spent earning. So really for our drivers, the optimal solution, both for our drivers and actually for the, for the city and the, and the, the, the grid uh, is to, to do overnight charging. Um, and when we look at many cities, probably with the exception of Amsterdam, uh, there's just not enough overnight charging near where drivers live. And I think Amsterdam is particularly notable because they've really led that through their policy of having a right to charge where anyone in the city 
who wants to have who wants to move into an electric vehicle uh, can ask the government for uh, a uh, charger to be installed near their home. And we would love to see, and we really encourage uh, cities to, to make similar moves like that. Um, we're absolutely committed to partnering with cities to solve this problem, um, but it requires being very joined up both in the actions that we can take, and I'll talk about a few of those, uh, and make sure they're fully aligned with policies that the cities put in place to really drive electrification. So if I take, take, some, make, take some examples, in, in London in 2018, the mayor implemented the congestion charge zone in central London, but exempted electric vehicles. And that provided a strong incentive uh, for our drivers to move into electric vehicles. So we've supported them by implementing uh, a clean air charge where riders traveling through central London uh, will be uh, will pay an extra 15 peak per kilometer uh, and that money goes into a driver savings account so the individual driver will get that money uh, to be redeemed against their their first upgrade to a battery electric vehicle and what that means is we've raised over 120 million pounds to support drivers in that tra transition in addition uh, in London we, we see that we saw that whilst there was good charging in the center of London there was not good charging near where our drivers need it. So we've lent in and we've uh, made a commitment to invest five million pounds to help drivers uh, install chargers uh, near where they live. And we're working closely with local councils to make sure that happens. Um, now, these are just some of the tools that we, we have and some of the things we're willing to do uh, as and when the policy environment is right, working in conjunction with government to make sure we deliver on our commitments to be fully electric. Uh, in London by 2025 uh, and across Europe by 2030. The move to battery electric vehicles is a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. So there's two problems why professional drivers like ours, indeed any driver, uh, doesn't make the move to battery electric vehicles. The, the first one is the higher upfront cost. Uh, and the second one is range anxiety, the worry that you won't be able to charge the vehicle as and when you need it. Um, and the irony is both of these problems can be fixed by salt selling more EVs. So as you sell more EVs, the upfront price will come down um, because you can amortize the, the high upfront costs over more vehicles. Uh, and also by selling more EVs, you create the incentives for infrastructure providers uh, to start building more infrastructure. So therefore, it's absolutely critical uh, in when cities think about how they overcome this chicken and an egg problem um, to really be clear where the early mass adopters of electric vehicles are gonna be, because that's how you start the flywheel of electric electrification. It's not gonna happen everywhere all at once. It's gonna happen in small pockets uh, from which you can get the momentum uh, to then roll it out. And, you know, my belief, and I, I think belief of many, is that professional drivers, drivers who drive a lot, um, are the early mass adopters of electric vehicles. And therefore, when I look at the benefits that cities will get uh, and that we will get from the adoption of electric vehicles in our fleet, uh, they're really threefold. Firstly, it's cleaner air for cities. Secondly, it's lower running costs for drivers. So once they're in the electric vehicle, actually there's lower running costs, which means uh, more of the money that, that they earn um, goes, goes to them. Uh, and thirdly, it helps cities overcome the chicken and the egg problem uh, because the early mass adopters by, by growing electric vehicle penetration in the, in the group of early mass adopters, that's how you get the flywheel going, group going to roll out uh, electrification to all vehicles in the city. EV charging utilization is absolutely critical because when we talk to people who are installing or want to install chargers, um, the key thing is how often are they going to be used because how often they are used is really the biggest driver of the returns that
that the investors can get in the assets that they've, they've put into the ground. So we're working with a number of providers like BP, um, but also like local councils in, in many cities across Europe to try and make sure that uh, the utilization of those charges is as good as it possibly can be. Um, and critical to that is putting the charges in the right place where they're needed. So in, in many cities, actually, charges are, are, are located in central areas, uh, which ironically is not where people live. So whilst you need rapid charges in central areas, what you need is you need slow charges uh, close to people's homes, uh, particularly when they don't have uh, off-street parking. So we have a lot of data um, that we share with uh, private companies and also with governments about where drivers live, how they drive. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to be very, very clear on the best points to put charging infrastructure today. So we've worked with BP uh, and we're rolling out, working with them to roll out charges in zones in outer London. Um, and we also work with cities like Amsterdam where the way they've overcome the problem of putting charges where they're needed is uh, ironically to our citizens. So they have a right to charge, uh, which means that any citizen living in Amsterdam can request a charger near their home. So you know once the request has come um, that uh, the demand is going to be there. Um, and what Amsterdam also does, which is particularly good, is they have very transparent data about utilization, uh, which any third party can get. So therefore, uh, it becomes very easy for others who want to build infrastructure to see what the utilization is in different parts of the city, where there's uh, underutilization, and most importantly, where there's overutilization, because that's obviously the best place uh, to build new charges. When I talk to our drivers, one of the biggest issues they face today is the hugely disparate range of, of companies, usually private companies, providing EV infrastructure, which means that your card may, that works on one may not work on another, and you therefore have to keep a bank of, of EV charging cards in your wallet. Now, we, we don't think that works for anyone, and we therefore strongly encourage governments and cities to really ensure interoperability between all charging infrastructure. Thank you, Jamie. And now I'll leave you in the capable hands of Erska Skirt, Mobility Manager at WBCSD and moderator of this session. So welcome back to eVision, Accelerating Fleet Electrification in Europe. My name is Urška Skirt. I'm a manager of mobility in World Business Council for Sustainable Development. This is a CEO-led organization focusing on accelerating sustainability in the world. And my current focus is leading the project of decarbonization, unlocking the value on the intersection between energy mobility and real estate. Uh, with my background in smart grid and electric vehicles, I'm very excited for our discussion today and I'm looking forward to hear from our panelists. So this session will look at the details for creating profitable and successful business model. We will be really focusing on the fleet perspective. And as the Euroelectric study points out, uh, many of the companies will still rely on the public charging infrastructure in addition to the private one. So today we have some great panelists. Uh, let me introduce them. We have the Christopher, Managing Director of Europe at ChargePoint. We have Eric, President and CEO at GREV. And we have Peter, Immobility e Lead at Euroelectric, which is association representing the European electricity industry. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm very honored for all of you to be here today. And um, let me first uh, ask my first question to Christopher from ChargePoint. Uh, Christopher, 
As a global leader in EV charging, what is the main trend that you see in the coming years for the successful business model? Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Urska. Um, maybe a few words very quickly on ChargePoint. Um, we're a um, US um, originated tech, Silicon Valley tech uh, company that really started uh, over 10 years ago when there weren't actually very many electric vehicles around. So if you would have asked me that question uh, that long ago, there wouldn't have uh, there would have been a big question mark around the business models. Today, I think um, when you look at how large the networks are of companies like ours, we manage uh, you know, 115,000 charging stations on behalf of our customers uh, on our network. We've got access of another 130, 140,000 through roaming integrations. Um, the new fueling network, as we call it, is really here to stay. Um, I also want to say that the industry's really moved on because um, we also uh, launched last year, so in 2020, uh, Charge Up Europe as an industry federation bringing together electric vehicle uh, companies like ourselves. We founded that together with Allego and EV Box. Uh, we have 11 members now. We're growing very rapidly. I, I was appointed president of the association at the end of last year. So this is really our first full year. And uh, another good example of the fact that these business models are now actually translating into actions. And of course, with all the great initiatives around greening uh, the economy and the transition to electric mobility, it's a very timely topic. So in terms of business models and to your question, I think we're focused on fleet here, and we always differentiate between two different market segments. One of them is really cars that are driven, purchased, or financed privately, and that people use for everyday commuting. And then you've got the whole sector of fleet. Uh, the interesting thing about um, how vehicles are brought to market in Europe is that actually part of that private vehicle market is also a fleet market because of company cars and because many people use as individual cars, cars that are made available through a fleet that a company owns and that is made available through a leasing company or purchased by the company. And so that can almost be seen as fleet. So the fleet market is actually very, very large. And there's really three sort of areas uh, within that. So one area is um, vehicles that continuously go back to the same garage that are used often for delivery, for transportation of goods, um, sometimes also people, but vehicles that have uh, routes that allow them to start in one location, come back to that location and be charged there. And the opportunity really for electrification is that the garage suddenly also becomes the location where the fueling is happening, because obviously having access to the electricity grid is possible everywhere. And this is where policy obviously also comes in um, you know, energy uh, energy being allowed to be accessed in buildings, for example, is very important. But so that is one business model where there's actually no reliance on a public network because from a total cost of ownership perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense uh, for a lot of businesses to own their own infrastructure and to rely on the infrastructure that they own um, within that garage, or at least that they have access to if it's third party financed. Um, the second piece really is sort of um, uh, fleet vehicles that uh, can charge in one location, but that need to top up on route because uh, they are driving further than the battery um, of the vehicle uh, allows or because it's just very efficient because of rest times and brakes that are built in or, for example, loading and unloading uh, at customer sites and, and, and uh, to top up on route and to use a mix, a hybrid basically of a dedicated fueling, uh, fueling system and a public fueling system. And of course, all of that brought together through a technology, a back end that, inter that talks to the uh, fleet management um, uh, uh, software on the one hand, and that talks to the um, to the telematics of the vehicle on the other end in order to also optimize for route uh, for routes and so on. Um, and then the third one really is uh, sort of fleets that are almost entirely reliant on public infrastructure. There's very few cases where uh, that would happen today. Um, 
I think even in cases, um, you know, one of our customers, a large telecom company in the UK, for example, um, the fleet vehicles go back to usually stay with the driver. Uh, so they stay out of the company's domain. But um, the opportunity to use home charging, for example, to fuel those vehicles overnight is actually pretty much sufficient to keep those vehicles running every day. But you do have, and especially when we get into trucks, um, that drive long distance, we will have situations in which a lot of fleet operators will continue continue to rely on the equivalent of something that looks much more like a petrol station network that we know from, from internal combustion engine vehicles. And of course, that then requires fleet mobility solutions, just like the ones that we know for fueling. Um, but still, again, the whole digitization being integrated into the vehicle in order for the optimization with fleet management software, telematics, and so on. So those are really the three sort of um, big areas that I would uh, I would uh, look at when it comes to fleet. The business models um, are very much reliant around total cost of ownership. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that electrification brings is uh, servicing gets cheaper, fueling gets cheaper. The vehicles might in some cases still be a little bit more expensive. But that's actually changing very rapidly and often also through financing solutions of the vehicle and the integration of a financing solution for the vehicle and charging is also starting to to come about and that's obviously companies like ours are driving that as well so i think a really important topic uh, especially also because policy is now opening up to addressing a lot of the friction that is still out there be it through the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive, be it through the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive or the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. All of those are being reviewed, which is a unique opportunity to actually ensure that we streamline the market environment to fit the business environment and to allow that growth to really happen. Um, so I would leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, my second question is to Eric from Jurev. So interoperability of the charging process is major part also to ensure customer satisfaction and consequently to increase, increase the utilization rates of the EV charging. Um, being at the intersection of different stakeholders, what is your perspective on the topic of interoperability? Yes, I, I agree. This this uh, interoperability uh, is uh, key uh, in, in this this system, and we 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 well know this because we are a, a European uh, um, digital interoperability platform, uh, which means a, a connect place between uh, all the stakeholders, as you said, um, marketplace, and we uh, in fact uh, process the transactions. Um, between hundreds of players in uh, in the ecosystem, um, and we uh, our insight on, on 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 this ecosystem comes from the the, the data that we manipulate and, and uh, aggregate in our uh, um, uh, system. So we basically what we see is we we host uh, charging sessions, meaning we know uh, how many people uh, in real time go uh, charging uh, where and when does it take and so on and so forth uh, so this is the first first part of the the, the data that we have uh, in GREV and the second part is the, the both uh, static and dynamic uh, POI meaning uh, where is the uh, charging infrastructure located uh, um, uh, is it uh, available is it busy uh, so uh, and this is refreshed uh, all the time and, and this is accessible in real time so we aggregate and we we process all those data, um, meaning that a long time we've been uh, building uh, um, uh, an AI uh, data science department, uh, which is able to uh, aggregate, source, uh, enrich, uh, uh, analyze uh, this, um, the, the, all those use cases and, and prices and so on, and to deliver the information. Basically, we deliver the data, or we can deliver the advisory based on those uh, data um, as well and um, when it comes to um, to fleets 
yes, obviously, we, we, we see uh, being a, a sort of neutral player in the center of the ecosystem, we see what the fleet can, can bring uh, to, to foster the development of e-mobility um, because of the characteristics of this, this uh, segment, the fleet seg segment, they, they provide uh, I'd say three different things. Um, first, uh, volume uh, size, uh, you know, compared to uh, the aggregation of all uh, individuals, uh, EV drivers, then obviously fleets are, are bringing more uh, volume. And also most of the time, not always, but most of the time, uh, well identified uh, use cases. Uh, different fleets have different use cases. And along with that, uh, comes also a certain amount of predictability, uh, which uh, maybe is not uh, uh, as uh, as much to be seen in when it comes to uh, individual users. Um, and when you take those three items, uh, volume plus uh, well-identified use cases plus predictability, then those three topics are very useful in any type of business. If you want to generate uh, efficient products, if you want the players to um, to manage their capex and opex and optimize their business models, and for everybody to reduce the risk uh, connected to to any kind of activity, you like to rely on a certain amount of uh, volume, uh, predictable, uh, easy to understand uh, scenarios, uh, use cases. Um, so from all point of view, uh, yes, we, we see this. Um, we, we don't need this because, as I said, uh, um, based on uh, data science, uh, we're capable of providing volume and predictability and, and predictive scenario, uh, even when we aggregate uh, in individual use cases. But definitely, uh, for uh, as far as fleets are concerned, uh, this is, uh, they are um, they bring those uh, items uh, by, by, by nature. I mean, uh, and and uh, I'd say that um, the, the um, more and more fleets will, will, will take their, their, their uh, uh, will uh, enter into the system, and that would be that will be beneficiary for um, every player. I mean, uh, everybody is going to benefit from uh, uh, the, the the development of the the, the um, uh, well the coming. Uh, the fleets in the interoperability uh, ecosystem, definitely. Um, thanks for your insight, Eric. Um, my next question is now for Peter. So your team has recently released a study on accelerating the electric fleets in Europe. What specific market opportunities does fleet EV charging bring? Thank you, Vushka for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be a uh, part of this uh, discussion today, uh, representing Euroelectric. Uh, so for those of you uh, who have followed our work over the last months, uh, you've probably noticed that we focused quite a lot of our efforts uh, on assessing the feasibility of different use cases for uh, EV fleets, because we see this really as a catalyst to accelerate electric mobility which for us also means decarbonization of transport and decarbonizing the economy. Um, we look at all this from both the environmental side of things, but also from a competitiveness standpoint. And um, I'll share some of our findings, uh, specifically when it comes to the market opportunities that arrive from uh, fleet electrification from both those perspectives. Um, so in our uh, project, we were uh, assessing the whole market of fleet vehicles, uh, which in Europe is about 63 million vehicles. And uh, as was mentioned by um, Chris, those are company cars that are either leased or owned for different business uses. So we looked at the different uh, breakdowns for, of those business uses and we identified uh, several that are more or less the vast majority of the market use. Uh, and we saw that those 63 million vehicles in total are only 20% of all vehicles uh, that we have on the European roads, um, but they travel half as more, and uh, ultimately they emit CO2 emissions twice as more. Uh, so we see that if those are electrified, that would mean more electric kilometers on the road. Uh, and also uh, this would improve the business case of charging because of the increased utilization of the chargers. So definitely for us, this is um, a good starting point, 
um, we see also that uh, EVs have a uh, lower total cost of ownership with a decreased battery price. Um, they also unlock uh, a second-hand market because of the fast fleet renewal. Um, and we think that this would improve also the competitiveness of companies who rely on, on vehicles, could be new vehicles, but also could be second-hand vehicles as well in some cases. Uh, and we think that all those vehicles, uh, when charged uh, and when connected to the power system, uh, they have the great potential to unlock a whole new market, uh, a whole new market of services and solutions for fleets, uh, which would allow both small and big companies to experience uh, different solutions um, when connected to the electricity network, when utilizing um, even secondhand batteries. So all those uh, are market opportunities that we assessed and we uh, see that it's a billion euro business um, in the coming decade. Uh, where companies who have already started investing see um, the benefits even during the times of, um, of a pandemic and a shrinking market. We still see that uh, in Europe, um, over the course of 2020, there was a um, 120% rise in the sale of electric vehicles uh, with more than 1 million uh, battery and plug-in electric vehicles sold. Uh, so this for us is definitely something that uh, we keep a close eye also when it comes to uh, policy making, because yes, it's true that businesses have quite a lot to do, um, but also uh, we see that policy has to play an important role, both at EU level, but also at uh, national level. And this will again unlock uh, separate opportunities, uh, more related to funding especially, because what we see uh, in terms of EU instruments, we have an availability of uh, funding under the 10T framework. So those are the main corridors and roads in Europe where we can have a dedicated project which um, is stimulating also fleet charging. As it was mentioned, some fleets will have to rely on public charging ultimately, but also depot charging. That also can be, um, in a way, ameliorated in the so-called urban nodes, which are um, the intersections between different cities uh, where you can benefit from uh, public-private partnerships uh, at a better rate of, of co-financing. So we think that synergies along those uh, corridors in respect to the policies at EU level are to be exploited in the context of fleets and have to be included in the context of fleets. We also see that um, several other legislative pieces are uh, being revised, and we think that the focus there could be really on increasing the utilization rate of the chargers when it comes to funding. Um, and we will see uh, quite a lot of funding also going to the uh, power infrastructure, so the digital uh, infrastructure, which is also the power infrastructure, so the grids, essentially. Um, and in our uh, study, we, we saw that while there is a big market opportunity, there is no single actor that is positioned to fulfill everything that is needed. So our conclusion in our interviews also, it was uh, heard from many senior executives around Europe that we really need to foster collaboration. And we see that the electricity sector is quite well positioned, not just to collaborate with the automotive industry. We already have quite a lot of members from our industry that partner with different um, automotive OEMs. But we also see uh, the role of um, e-mobility service providers, charging point operators, also uh, public authorities are involved. So for us, uh, it's really about the first movers and making sure that uh, we shared the value uh, that we see in, in first movers on the market. Um, so I really invite everyone that um, heard all that to also have a look at our report uh, for more detailed analysis of the different market and operational characteristic of fleet vehicles. And we've assessed uh, which should be the first movers and where is the real value. Uh, so thank you for that. I'll leave it here and uh, looking forward to the debate. Thanks a lot, Peter. So um, now I think we can turn to our short debate. Uh, there were already a lot of interesting points brought out by all three of you, but um, let's dig in a, a bit more into the business case, and uh, especially from the perspective of the fleets. So where do you see the added value of the EV fleets for the business case of EV charging? And I'm specifically also interested in smart charging. Shall I, shall I give give it a go, Oscar? 
Yeah. Give it a go, yeah. please. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try and make a stake because I actually, um, when I was uh, was listening to the debate, I was thinking, you know, I didn't say much about company cars, and actually, it's a very interesting uh, use case, and I think maybe Eric's got some points there too from an interoperability point of view. But um, the reason why it's interesting is because the cars are pretty much used like any personal vehicle would be used, right? But um, but they, they show a very interesting use case for the following reason. Um, they actually bring together the three dimensions of the fueling network that um, doesn't exist in internal combustion engines, and it actually makes a very, very compelling case for, uh, for uh, EVs. Uh, they bring together home, they bring together sort of semi-public, meaning behind the fence public at a workplace, for example, with restricted access, and public uh, charging usage. Why? Because most of those vehicles are used primarily for commuting. So um, very much focused on charging them at work, topping up, not waiting until you know the battery is empty, but topping up at work. And of course, charging at home when you can with reimbursement, which then puts some challenges on the on the on the digital sort of fleet services that come with it, but that are very easy to solve today. Um, in addition, of course, those vehicles are used for business trips, they're used for holidays, they're used for many different opportunities where you either traveling within your country or you're going beyond borders and you need that interoperability that the Giraffe provides you um, or that is provided through peer-to-peer -peer roaming between networks, meaning between a charge point and an EV box or a charge point and an Allego, just as examples, right? And so that's why is that really attractive? Because the, the, the employer, because I think we were talking a little bit about, um, about um, uh, interoperability, the employer doesn't actually necessarily um, care about utilization of their infrastructure the same way as a public network would, right? The employer is making uh, charging available as an amenity. Actually, when you look at the cost of providing, um, you know, electricity to those vehicles, um, compared to what you would be paying for fuel because they're company cars, so you would be paying for that, it's minimal. And if you've got other employees who come with their own private vehicles, it's the equivalent of offering them coffee or some snacks in the office, which you know most employers do today. The utilization there is much more linked to you know how much capital do I need to invest in my fleet of infrastructure, and therefore you like to rotate cars through the infrastructure. Uh, so it's much more based around how many charges do I need to build up. And then when you're looking at that from a public uh, point of view, of course, their utilization, yes, matters when the charging station is linked to a business model that is actually alimented by selling electricity as fuel. Um, that is the case in the case of fast chargers. But in the case of a lot of other charging opportunities at supermarkets or at shopping malls or equivalent, actually the owner and the host of that infrastructure makes charging available much more to draw you into their store and make more money on their core business than to try and make a little bit of extra money on the charging. Um, now, uh, you mentioned V2G, so very briefly on V2G, V2G over time and smart charging, well, smart charging already exists today and that's much more linked to, I don't need my full capacity of my battery all the time. So, you know, I can, I can manage the amount of power going to the vehicle depending on, you know, different elements like cost, availability, whatever else. But obviously when you can go both ways in the future and today that's already possible in some cases, it makes it even more interesting in terms of looking at how you can balance out loads and so on and use the batteries that are connected to the grid through those charges. So that's maybe just some thoughts around that to stimulate some debate, but yeah. Very good insights. Maybe a, a thought that came into my mind. So how to solve this question of ownership of these charging stations and the grid reinforcement that is happening behind? Because of course it's ideal business case if the charging stations are based close to existing network infrastructure and you need to balance where the people are based in time and where you have the charging stations and um, you have to also balance with other consumptions for instance if you have the um, if you have the load at the industries but how to really uh, um, balance these different um, 
uh, interests of different stakeholders. So network reinforcement, um, having available parking spaces that are um, attractive to the user so that they're not far from the offices, that there are enough of them that they enable uh, fast enough charging. So in some cases, you're able to have the slow charging. In some cases, you need also to have a fast charging and so on. So how to balance all these different requirements from stakeholders? I think I think this this will come uh, naturally uh, up to some point, as long as you make things possible first, and then uh, you make the information available, and then the different players are going to um, to digest the the the, uh, the potentialities they have uh, and and the inv information available to optimize their own business models. Uh, for instance, uh, yes. Uh, it's interesting to to understand that that um, fleet charging infrastructure, uh, privately owned, can be open to uh, the general public, um, either to to better amortize the the, the cost of, you know, of the, those investments for for the the, uh, the fleet owner, uh, but on the other hand also to help uh, the general public to to find uh, more. Uh, uh, more places to 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 go and, and, and charge their vehicles, um, and so that would be beneficial for everybody. But then you have to make it smooth uh, to to make the information available and uh, and for everyone to uh, uh, to optimize uh, it, uh, having a, in keeping in mind uh, his own situation. As as far as uh, smart charging is is concerned, uh, it's pretty much the same. Uh, today we, we are we are already capable of uh, aggregating data and um, and building prospective analysis uh, and telling the guys who are interested in uh, uh, playing on the flexibility uh, for the, the providing of uh, energy to to this ecosystem. So we can tell maybe in three years' time uh, on Fridays between 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. there will be the equivalent of uh, uh, one uh, a nuclear plant. Uh, uh, layer uh, needed in the in, in the system. Um, as long as we as we have the information, we can make it more uh, uh, a different different level of, of aggregation, like like regions, countries, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think the the. Um, those, as long as it's, this is available and uh, as long as it's feasible, but it's not uh, it's not so easy. You need uh, um, you need um, cyber security. You need data protection. You need uh, uh, standards, uh, the same standards for uh, uh, interoperability operability through a platform or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, charging uh, need to, to to be based on the same protocol, same charging uh, st standards, and so on and so forth. So there are many things to do. <laughs> Uh, to make this uh, smooth and efficient and and and, uh, and to enhance quality and develop security and so on um, but at the end of the day um, as long as it's uh, feasible technically feasible uh, at a reasonable cost and uh, the information is uh, available and uh, analyzable and uh, you can uh, uh, deliver added value information to the players uh, the, I think there are interesting things to be done. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And what, please go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I was just going to add a few points to what I just heard because I was also thinking in that direction. That's something that we see also um, among different players in our in our electricity sector. What we uh, have noted recently, especially on the communication part, which is uh, also a revenue stream uh, when you have the data communication. Uh, it's very important to have um, open access. Uh, and this access, of course, has to be protected by certain security protocols and uh, characteristics, so it shouldn't be vulnerable to cybersecurity risks. But also, I think it's very important when um, you have multiple actors planning their um, perspectives going forward to keep in mind the market growth and the technology evolution. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't restrict uh, technology in any way. Um, I think it's quite uh, important to say that in the next 10 years, you, you would expect uh, quite a lot of uh, rollout of uh, vehicles on the road. 
So mm -hmm. uh, when you plan now, even for a small fleet, you need to keep a perspective that in the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, electric will be the majority of, of what you own as a fleet. So uh, this planning needs to start now. And also, um, I, I believe that as vehicles evolve and you get more range and better battery technology out of the vehicle, that means that the charging pattern will also change. Um, and that's part of all those operational characteristics of the vehicles that make it easier um, to have uh, last mile deliveries, but still um, deliveries between cities are a bit uh, more difficult when you talk about electric. Yes, and I think it will be also quite interesting how to balance different consumption patterns. So, for instance, uh, corporate fleets, so employers will have different demands than um, ride hailing and different services. So, how much are we using currently this data from different consumption patterns to um, balance the current uh, charging infrastructure? How, how advanced we are in the complexity? So, so let me maybe talk about that for a second because the back, so the core of our company is in the end a software platform, right? So we manage a lot of data on that. We don't sell that data. We don't do anything with that data except for providing analytics to the customers we have about their own use and how to optimize their use and so on. I think um, what's really important is there's many, many different use cases. So when you go from a fueling model that is fuel, that is petrol based, you're basically going from one business model, right? Which is nobody owns their own, very few people own their own petrol station. Some bus depots will have a fuel uh, tank in the ground, but pretty much you're buying that from a very defined third party, which is an oil and gas company, right? Now you're going to electric, so now suddenly electricity is available in a very different manner. I agree with Petter that interoperability is key. I think that, you know, it's a little bit like telecoms, right? So there's different there's different networks and you may need to make sure that those networks interoperate because otherwise you end up without cell coverage and that's not what you want to do. But what's important is the following. The important thing is that it's it's a very it's almost like a decentralized energy system with lots of different use cases. So Eric was talking about the fact just let people give people access, make sure that, you know, buildings are ready to accept charges, make sure that grid capacity can be extended if needed, but also that grid capacity that's available can be optimized because the system is going to develop very organically. It's, there isn't a master plan around this, right? But I'll give you some, I'll, I'll give you one example that I think really shows the power of technology and of data is you have a big bus depot in the middle of a very large European city, right? You have a hundred buses that go in, out all day long, that run different routes, and they're all electric now. If you put um, chargers in there that might be very powerful, but they don't talk to the, the bus, the telematics of the bus, they don't talk to the scheduling system that those buses are on, and they just hammer power into those buses as soon as they come into the depot, you're going to need an enormous amount, megawatts of capacity at a bus depot like that. If you create a technology platform and you digitalize uh, what your operations and you know, the software knows um, when the buses are coming in, the, buses, the, the software knows when the buses are going out, how long the route is, um, uh, knows what variations there can be based on traffic patterns, based on weather patterns and so on, of how much power that bus is going to need to finish its route, um, optimizes the vehicles around that um, so that the vehicles can be focused on charging at that depot, and then also ensures that so telematics, fleet management software, and charging software work together. You can then put the amount of capacity you need to charge those buses at over time, so it's a, it's a curve over time, um, and lower the load that you need at that location. So minimize the impact on the grid and maximize the utilization of the overall system with, of course, certain reserves for variations and so on. And that actually, when you look at some specific use cases, and I have one in mind, I can't talk, I can't say who it is, but it doesn't matter either. You know, you can reduce uh, to a third the capacity needed at a place like that just through intelligence, just through smartness and so on. That's one use case, right? 
if you use a ride hailing service, it'll be a very different use case that's probably going to be matched to the, the, the sort of patterns of, uh, of demand that the drivers face because they'll want to charge when there's not that much that many people asking for rides, right? And they'll mm -hmm. probably do that at fast charges in decentralized locations, but close to where the next wave of demand is going to come from. But anyway, so it's it's a real, it's a lot of different use cases together in one system. It's way too early to, you know, know what that master plan is going to be. Uh, it's really important that grid expansion is part of the plan. But, mm -hmm. you know, the point is the data is there. Um, the data is being used, but what's also really important is to just let people get started. And that's what people are doing, right? To Peter's point, I mean, people are now, fleet managers are looking at this. They're not going to change everything from one day to another. So there's going to be some hybrid time uh, in between. But that's really important is to understand those use cases and know that fleet, the whole fleet of electrification is based around these different use cases. Hmm. And what you said is really powerful. So if you can decrease by third investments, uh, capital investments, only by managing the loads, that's um, quite a lot of value that we are unlocking. So thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe just the last question, I think, uh, then we'll have to um, close our discussion. But... I think uh, another great point uh, was brought by Christopher earlier, and I would like to have this as a, as a conclusive uh, discussion. Um, it's a chicken and the egg question, kind of. Uh, should we first plan the charging infrastructure, or should we um, adapt the charging infrastructure to the usage of the people? Is it really an organic process, or how much of the planning does it need? As Chris was saying, uh, there's no building a master plan. You know, this is not going to come from uh, logical thinking and then uh, everybody uh, thinks of uh, the, la the landing of the ecosystem and uh, it's not working like this. You know, as uh, thousands, uh, hundreds of uh, private players, uh, sometimes they have opposite interests. Uh, they all want to make money. Not a lot of them are making money now because the volumes are still very low and, uh, and, the, and the ecosystem is not mature enough. But um, so so it, 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 it and it's very complicated and it is uh, there are many many things we haven't talked about uh, how much green energy you put into the system because you can also think of not only reducing the cost and not only foster uh, immobility but inside immobility the the, the 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 electricity which comes into the battery does it come from uh, uh, green uh, energy uh, or does it come from less green energy? Um, so all this, uh, we have the data. You know, in 2021, uh, we can uh, we can use uh, data science and uh, algorithms and so on and so forth, and we have an idea of what would be a win-win situation for everybody in uh, three, five years. And the challenge is to enable uh, each kind of player to find a way to make its business profitable. And at the same time, for the the, the, um, the states to, to be sure that all this will benefit to the end customer, that the, the free competition will still be uh, uh, possible. Uh, so it's really, it's really complicated but I think it's um, it's the same everywhere. That, that's that, that's that's the how things are <laughs> going in, in many industries, and um, and this is by generating uh, discussions between the players, uh, uh, trying to find solutions at different levels, uh, addressing different problems, uh, keeping in mind uh, the consequences of what, what we're doing, and um, then we hope we will gradually uh, uh, come to uh, uh, a situation where. Uh, the, 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 the ecosystem is uh, far uh, more developed than today uh, for the, the benefit of everybody. And there is good news, right? So there is good news because the good news is that the chicken and the egg, it could be a chicken and the egg conundrum, <laughs> but luckily it's not. Because the good thing is that right now, the situation is that the charge is attached to the vehicle. Now, I'm not talking about public funding that's really pushing charging sort of station uh, targets and so on. But typically, 
you start worrying about charging once you've ordered the vehicle. And when you look at um, the, the, the law of numbers, today there are, there are more people wanting to buy electric vehicles than there are vehicles available. So the number of vehicles that's available is, to, is, is, is insufficient, and the types of vehicles uh, that you have a choice of um, are still very limited. Now, all of that actually is going to make a big leap forward this year because car manufacturers are coming out with a lot of attractive vehicles um, uh, this year. And that is really the story of the next three to five years, in my opinion, is we will suddenly be um, in a situation where we will have ample choice uh, of vehicles. And that will really accelerate things because one of the things we didn't talk about and we don't have to belabor because I know we want to get to the end, but is the residual value of internal combustion engine vehicles is plummeting like crazy. So, ex so private use cases where people can't afford to buy an EV or a secondhand EV are a problem. That's where subsidies will need to be put in place so people can afford, families can afford that. Fleet operators, it's purely a question of, am I, you know, what's my return on investment? What's my total cost of ownership? And the residual value matters. So you will next invest in a vehicle that holds its residual value, and that is going to be electric. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think also uh, the fact that you have uh, more choice of vehicles and more availability is something that um, means that the chicken is crossing the road, right? So, uh, and the egg will be uh, ultimately a market of customers, both from a fleet perspective, but also from a company perspective. And there will be a lot of eggs. Um, now, the question is, where is the golden egg? And uh, the answer to that could be indeed going back to collaboration. So making sure that it's not just uh, one player who is closing the ecosystem and making sure that uh, they get all the revenue or they um, are well positioned. Um, but it's, uh, I think the benefit will be with, with more players on the market, um, pushing the market forward also from a technological point of view. And when it comes to... Um, I personally don't have a vehicle yet, and I really want my first car to be electric. So I, I'm really trying my best to push for that as much as possible. Um, great. Uh, I love the debate, um, but let me now wrap up shortly. So um, first, thank you to all of you for the great insights. Um, it was a pleasure to have this discussion with you. So what we learned today is definitely very valuable. So apparently we will have to have a lot of more discussion and uh, continuous sharing of experience as it's difficult to make a master plan. We definitely know that um, electric fleets are crucial for accelerating uh, electric mobility. We know that uh, it's crucial also to balance different types of use cases, so not focusing only on one type of use case, set, but several ones. And in order to increase the usability and um, in order to connect different markets, energy market with mobility market, it's crucial to focus also on interoperability. So there are many different uh, market opportunities. Um, for instance, charge point mentioned that um, charging infrastructure will also create different opportunities in terms of the land use. So there is a range of use cases um, that are still perhaps unimaginable, but will come in the future. And I believe that um, one thing that uh, we should keep an eye on is, of course, to continue this dialogue and exchange the ideas, uh, especially um, listening to the companies and leaders, uh, such as were panelists today, and uh, to make sure that really the companies who are positioning their actions and business models towards sustainability, so towards optimizing the charging and also usage of renewable sources are the ones that come to this golden egg that we were discussing today. So um, 
I would like to thank you again for the participation and for the discussion. And with this, I would uh, end this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.